The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. As Jesus passed by, he saw a blind man, a man blind from birth. He, his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither he nor his parents sinned. It is so that the works of God might be made visible through him. We have to do the works of the one who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva and smeared the clay on his eyes and said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back able to see. His neighbors and those who had seen him earlier as a beggar said, isn't this the one who used to sit and beg? Some said, it is. But others said, no, he just looks like him. He said, I am. So they said to him, how were your eyes opened? He replied, the man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and told me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went there and washed and was able to see. And they said to him, where is he? He said, I don't know. They brought the one who was once blind to the Pharisees. Now Jesus had made clay and opened his eyes on a Sabbath. So then the Pharisees also asked him how he was able to see. He said to them, he put clay on my eyes and I washed, and now I can see. So some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a sinful man do such signs? There was a division among them. So they said to the blind man again, what do you have to say about him since he opened your eyes? He said, he is a prophet. Now the Jews did not believe that he had been blind and gained his sight until they summoned the parents of the one who had gained his sight. So they asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How does he see now? His parents answered and said, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. We do not know how he sees now, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he can speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone acknowledged him as the Christ, he would be expelled from the synagogue. For this reason, his parents said, he is of age, question him. So a second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give God the praise, we know that this man is a sinner. He replied, if he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know is that I was blind and now I see. So they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? They ridiculed him and said, you are that man's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but we do not know where this one is from. The man answered and said to them, this is what is so amazing that you do not know where he is from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if one is devout and does his will, he listens to him. It is unheard of that anyone who ever opened eyes of a person born blind, if this man were not from God, he would not be able to do anything. They answered and said to him, you were born totally in sin and you are trying to teach us? Then they threw him out. When Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, he found him and said, do you believe in the son of man? He answered and said, who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, you have seen him. The one speaking with you is he. He said, I do believe, Lord, and he worshiped him. Then Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not see might see and those who do see might become blind. Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard this and said to him, surely we are not also blind, are we? 
Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you are saying, We see, so your sin remains. The Gospel of the Lord. Good evening, everyone. I'm just going to take a moment of your time to preempt the homily. I'm not the homily today, but just to preempt it for a moment to, to share a message with you. And before I even do that, I have to welcome Father Tom's brother, Father Tom's sister and brother-in-law are here at Mass. Why don't we have you stand up so everyone knows who you are. I know that I'll be in trouble for this, but welcome. It's so wonderful to have you here. I'm going to guess all of us have had the uh, occasion, if it's in downtown Buffalo or <clears throat> some major city where we've uh, been asked for money by someone on the street. Huh? How many of you have ever had that happen? You know? And uh, one of my friends is kind of legendary. Every time we see him, we ask for the latest stories. He's, he's one of the individuals, very rare individual, that uh, he works in downtown Buffalo, walks the street every day during lunch hour. He will make a point to look for those who are homeless or begging on the street. As soon as he finds one, he will look them straight in the eye until they pass, and he will begin a conversation. And he knows that it's going to end by them asking him for money. And uh, he always has money in the pocket, ready and available, and he always, always gives. True story. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands how many of you do that, huh? You know, but uh, today's gospel really calls us to charity. You know, why Jesus is being accused uh, by the scribes, the Pharisees, you know, he can't really be a prophet working on the Sabbath. And what is Jesus really calling an understanding is uh, uh, understanding of charity. You know, what's, what's most important is to help someone in need, and that supersedes any law or command. And today, I come to you on behalf of those in need, and it is Catholic Charities time, as you well know. And you know, in 2015, here at St. Greg's, we had 2,045 families give to Catholic Charities, a total of $726,000 and $37 on top of it, so $726,37. Last year, 2016, we, we had a, a decline. We, we had 1,899 families donate, a total of $674,883. It's really astounding. Both years, the average gift came out to be exactly the same, $355. Tremendous gift. And today I come before you because uh, I'd like you to see the need for Catholic Charities and those in need in our parish. Some, like my friend, looks them square in the eye and makes the need head on. Some of us, you know, try to look the other way. And some of us might just be oblivious to the need, you know. We, we're not paying attention. We're concerned about other things. And today I invite you as a parish to really consider your role in Catholic Charities. You know, we are a parish of 6,000 families, and 1,899 are involved in giving to Catholic Charities. It's about 4,000 families who have not participated, seen that need. And I encourage you, if you're one of those individuals or families, to, to do so this year. Really prayerfully consider what you can do. I calculated if each family who did not give gave $50 would be another $200,000 to help those in need. If every family who did not give last year gave $25, it would be $100,000 given to those in need. They gave just $10 a piece. It's $40,000, which is what we were short last year. We never made our goal. And so I ask you, if you have not given in the past, please consider seeing that need and responding. And if you are one of the 1,899 who have given last year, I thank you for that generosity and, and, and thank you for your continued generosity. As I look at the decline of our donors, I match it up to those that we are burying. And the two lists overlap perfectly. So many of our older people who we 
have relied on are passing away. And so I invite us all to take that seriously, and I invite uh, all of our young people, our teenagers and young adults, to get involved in Catholic charities. Even if you can give one or two dollars, get involved. And this way, you can be a part of saying, I saw a need, and I helped feed the hungry, give clothes to the naked, to provide emergency aid and medical assistance and counseling to families and individuals in need. I thank you, as always, for your generosity. It's legendary throughout the diocese, and I ask for your continued help. Okay, that was not two minutes. <laughs> I promise I'm not going to read the whole book. Um, I think today, really, our readings are about what clouds our eyes from seeing as God sees? Is it our fear, our anxiety, maybe the appearance of other people, maybe their ideology, maybe their political ideology, their religious beliefs? What clouds our eyes? In that first reading, it's really a story about stereotyping. And God says he doesn't stereotype. You know, you've got um, Samuel, who's looking for a replacement to the king of Israel for Saul, and he goes to Jesse's house, who is David's father, and he sees that first son and he thinks, this is the king, this is what a king looks like, and so he's got to be the king. And what does God say to Samuel? He says, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not judge from his appearance or from his lofty standard, stature, because I reject him. God does not see as mortal who sees appearance. The Lord looks into the heart. It takes a lot longer for us to look into people's hearts. You know, we look at their appearance and right away we pass a judgment on them. But God looks into our hearts and he wants us to see people for who they are, not how they appear. That's not easy because it takes time for us to get to know someone and to understand them so that we can learn who they are and see the good that is inside them. That's what we're called to do. That's what God is asking us to do. In the gospel today, we have the blind man who's cured. And that first part of the story talks about, you know, Paul, Simon, Peter, asks Jesus, is this man's sin? He is blind because of his sin or his parents' sin? He says, Rabbi, who has sinned, this man or his parents? that he was born blind. How many times have we thought, oh my God, why are you doing this to me? What have I done that you are doing this to me? And I think a perfect example of that is, you know, you're driving along and you're going maybe a little faster than you should be, and the police pull you over, and the first thought you have is, oh my God, why am I getting a ticket? Why did you do this to me? As if somehow God is responsible for the ticket. The truth is, is, more than likely, you were driving a little faster than you should have been, and you have to suffer the consequences of that action. Sometimes, we make bad choices, and those choices have consequences. But that's not God having wrath on you or punishing you. That's just the fact that sometimes things happen. And that's what Jesus is saying to his disciples, that God is not responsible for the bad things that happen in the world. Sometimes, Things just happen, and that's the way it is. In our gospel, we have a bunch of characters. We have, of course, Jesus. We have the blind man. We have the Pharisees. And we have the parents. And most of the time in this story, we think about the blind man and Jesus, and maybe even the Pharisees. And of course, in the story, the blind man grows in his faith. He first sees Jesus as a good man. Then he sees him as a prophet. And finally, at the end of the story, he acknowledges him as Lord, as God. And of course, the Pharisees, they go the opposite way. First, they're wondering, how can this blind man see? Then they're skeptical. And then, of course, they're outright outraged and indignant. So they go from seeing to being completely blind. But the person, the character I want to focus on are the parents. Because it's interesting. What do the parents do? 
the parents say, his parents answered and said, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. Ask him, he is of age to speak for himself. They're afraid of being cast out of the temple. They're afraid of the consequences of defending their son. And so what do they do? They say, ask him. It's on him, he'll tell you. So in other words, they sort of throw him under the bus. And I think sometimes we can be like those parents. You know, when someone is criticizing the Catholic Church on issues, for example, the sanctity of life. The Catholic Church believes in the sanctity of life from conception till natural death. But not everyone in our society agrees. And when we're sitting in a group of people and they're disparaging the church's teaching on the sanctity of life, do we calmly and coolly say, you know what? The church believes that life is sacred and all life is sacred and important and valuable. Do we defend the church when she is being criticized in our social circles? Recently, Pope Francis wrote an encyclical on the environment and many people were aggravated by his encyclical, considering that he thought the church had a role in the environment. Well, it certainly does. It has a role in saying that we have been given this world to take care of it, to use our resources wisely and not destroy them. So when people criticize Pope Francis for that encyclical, do we stand up and defend him and say, it is our responsibility to care for this world? These are important things for us to do, to defend the church, when she is being criticized unjustly, to defend her in our faith, in our love, and in our circles. We should not be like the parents who just allow people to disparage the church and misguide and mislead people into what she teaches. So we're responsible to learn what the church teaches, why she teaches it, and then be willing to defend it when necessary. And of course, finally, we are called to be the light of the world. As St. Paul said, we are children of the light. We are called to proclaim that light in the darkness of the world. If all we do is gather here today, then what have we accomplished? But we gather here today to be nourished at this altar with the Eucharist so that we can go out and be children of the light, to be people who defend the faith and who live that faith as best they can knowing that God's love will flow, flow through us and bring love into the world. The Eucharist is the most sacred teaching of the church. As the Pope John Paul II said, it is the summit and source of our life. The sacraments are given to us by Jesus, the Eucharist being the most important. It nourishes us, gives us strength and courage to be faithful to God's teaching, to go out, and to be children of the light in a world of darkness. And as you know, if you watch the news or read the papers, there is a lot of darkness in the world, and the world needs us to be that light, to proclaim it as best we can, in love and with love and for love. And if we are the children of the world and the light of the world, we can make a difference in our lives and in our communities. So let us be nourished by this Eucharist today to go forward from here to be children of light.